Well, when we worked out some time ago that we would look at Romans together, um, I was uh, interested, looking forward to, nervous about this passage. Uh, it's a passage that I really love personally, but it's a passage that I feel is sometimes a little unusual. I don't think you will have heard many talks on this sort of topic. Uh, that's my guess. By all means, correct me later on and tell me. No, we used to have them every second week at the church I used to go to. But uh, Romans 6, starting at verse 1, we're going to do two weeks on Romans 6. Uh, and then we'll move on to, surprise, surprise, Romans 7. Well, let's, uh, let's join with me in prayer. Father in heaven, you are a speaking God. And uh, you really know how to speak to us clearly. Help us to be those who hear your voice. Uh, that we would especially hear what this passage from your word is saying we ask for your help in Jesus name Amen well as you heard um, the place to start with Romans 6 in the reading is to go back to Romans 5 uh, I'm hoping next week we'll have a bit of a brief uh, explanation of the map of the book how the book of Romans works out it, it's been an intention I've had for some time but one of the ways people often break it up is they say up to chapter 5, uh, it's about being right with God, being justified. 6, 7, 8 is about being sanctified, to use a big word, but being made holy and life. And then on you go through 9 to 11 and then 12 to uh, 13 and then 4, etc. Et et we'll we'll have, have a look at it next week. I want to suggest to you that's probably not quite as neat as um, some would like to say, and it's there in the first couple of words of chapter 6. What shall we say then? He's referring back, he's saying, what are, what are we to make of what I've just said in chapter 5 about grace triumphing perfectly and completely over our sinfulness? It is one of the hard things, isn't it, as a Christian, to believe that as we deal and wrestle with our own brokenness and sinfulness, that God's grace is as powerful and as free as the Bible says it is. But the verses that I, that I often have quoted to myself and to various friends in chapter 5, it says this, Where sin increased or abounded, God's grace superabounded. So you've got a market, you've got a supermarket. And it's saying, you know, no matter how much, you know, no matter how much your sin may seem to increase, God's grace is simply bigger and more powerful. The death of Jesus is more than able to deal with your sinfulness. So at that level, you can relax. So then comes the question, which I don't imagine... Well, who knows your experience? You may have met people who say they're Christians who argue this position. It's a minor position that has gone through church history... Or you may have heard a voice inside your own head say, look, if God is so gracious and the death of Jesus is so powerful, don't get all head up about sin. Just relax. I mean, you're not murdering someone, so you can just do it. And anyhow, when sin abounds, God's grace superabounds. So it actually helps God show his grace because I'm such a low life. And we actually use the grace of God and the gospel message in order to just continue sinning. He's actually touched on this back in chapter 3, verse 8, where he said he's been explaining something about the gospel, and then he says this, Why not say, as some slanderously claim we are saying, let us do evil that good may result? Their condemnation is just. Right? So he doesn't actually deal with this sort of statement, but he says they're going to get it as they deserve. But now he actually deals with this same question uh, at some length and gives the reason why you can't go the, from the free grace of God to carelessness about obedience. So we're going to look firstly at a sick man talking, then we're going to look at a dead man walking, and then dumb Christian sinning, and then on we go. So a sick man talking. So it is a sick response, an unhealthy response that says, what shall we say then? Verse 1. Shall we just go on sinning so that grace may increase? By no means. So here's the possible suggestion, which you may have heard in your own heart 
or you may have heard people actually say it. W.H. Auden, the poet, writes this. I like committing crimes. God likes forgiving them. Really, the world is admirably arranged. Or as a French philosopher said, the good God will forgive. That's his job. So that because of the mercy of God, people go, hmm, why should I bother? And uh, of course, this is actually a stronger statement because it's saying grace seems to act almost as the fertilizer around the tree of grace. So that the more fertilizer of sin you put, the more the grace tree grows. So let's do God a favor. Let's use the gospel as an excuse for evil. And it's a sick man talking at that point. Uh, To go from the gospel of the Jesus who dies to save us from our sins, to enable us to embrace the sins that were the reason of his death, is a sick way to think. So the Apostle Paul responds with this phrase, by no means, Uh, may it not be. In the old King James Version, it actually said, God forbid. Now, the word God isn't there, but I think that's catching the sense. It's a very strong statement of horror. So old J.B. Phillips, who made a great translation some decades ago, he said it, um, he spoke of what a ghastly thought. And ghastly, a great word. Try and use it this week. It doesn't get used enough. Ghastly. So, you know, he, and, and that's the sense of it. It's a horrible thing to take the death of Jesus as an excuse to continue in sin and the grace of God as an excuse to continue uh, carelessly disobeying God. It's a sick man talking there. But what's his reason? Why, why doesn't that make sense to do that? Because at one level, it makes a certain sort of sense. So he goes on in verse 2. Actually, he goes on to deal with this for much of this chapter. Verse 2. By no means. We are those who have died. Who's the we? It's the apostle and the Roman Christians. So at that level, it includes us. So if you're a genuine member of the church, if you're a sincere believer in Jesus... He's saying, you're a dead person. The apostle says, we are those who've died to sin. How can we then live in it any longer? You may know the movie Dead Man Walking many, many years ago. They don't do it in America anymore, but they used to, they used to do this, that when a man, all his appeals had gone, I, couldn't, I tried to check if it was said about women, but I couldn't find anything in the internet, so it obviously doesn't happen um, but they used to say, I think they stopped some decades ago, the, the group that would be taking him either to the electric chair or where the needles were going to be put in to kill him, uh, when they'd get up to leave and the man would shuffle off in chains, they would, one of the uh, prison guards would say, dead man walking, dead man walking here, because he's as good as dead. Um, but what, the, what it's saying here is the Christians, we're not as good as dead, we are dead. I don't know how often you think of yourself as a dead person. But it's very clear here, and he's going to go on and on and on, almost every verse in these 11 verses. He talks about death, death, death. We died, we died, we were crucified. We died with him. With him we died. We're dead, we're dead, we're dead, we're dead. It's one of the great themes that he goes through. Now, dead, of course, when you die, it sort of changes your relationships with things, doesn't it? I mean, I'm I'm appealing to you as if you know from... But you don't. But we, we guess that's what happens, isn't it? Relationships are broken. Things that used to dominate you. In fact, that's why some people have... The, every now and then we read of people who pretend to be dead. Now, there's a woman, as you might know, in, from the eastern suburbs of Sydney, near where I grew up, who apparently has ripped off all of her friends of hundreds and thousands and millions of dollars. Now, she's gone missing. Now, the police have a strong suspicion she's still alive. We don't know. But it's not uncommon when a person gets caught in crime. Or sometimes, frankly, it's happened when people have been caught in a dangerous marriage where they pretend to be dead to get out and to start again. Because death does, in a sense, set you free from past tyrants. We are those, says the apostle, who have died to sin. How can we live in it any longer? We are dead folks walking. Now, let me ask you about how you think about yourself, because he's going to say something very odd here. All those, I know, I'm sure many of you will have thought about this before. Verse 3, don't you know, and he's going to say this at least three times, don't you know, surely the apostle says you would have learnt this. 
even though he himself had not taught them. But he assumed this is fairly basic. Don't you know that all of us who were baptised into Christ Jesus were baptised into his death? We were therefore buried with him through baptism into death in order that just as Christ was raised from the dead through the glory of the Father, we too might live a new life. Now, frankly, from verses 5 through to 10, in various ways, he just picks up what's in these uh, verses here in verses 3 and 4. We're dead. We've been buried. We've raised, been raised from the dead. And it's all Jesus' fault. It's because of our connection to Jesus. Now... Um, I've got this heading here, it's probably unfair really. Dumb Christians sinning. Ignorant Christians sinning, but it doesn't have the same rhythm as dead man walking. So what he's saying is this. There's something which we ought to know. And it's caught up in two little words. Two very, very important words. Many of us would, you know, if, if we had to write down, imagine if you had to write down a paper, who are you? What are the really important things about who you are? And many of us would write the first thing, I'm a Christian. In our culture, and this is a new thing in our culture, people would write down their sexuality. I'm gay. I'm trans. I'm heterosexual. As if that's perhaps the defining feature. And that is an entirely culturally learnt thing. I don't think there's ever been a culture up until the last 30 years or 20 years where a culture has made that the defining reality of who you are. Right? And I've met and heard speak, sometimes Christian men who their attraction is to other men, same-sex attracted, but they think that's, a, that's just not who they are. They actually define themselves in the way that, that the Bible does. So we tend to say we're Christian, perfectly legitimate. It's three times in the Bible, twice in Acts and once in 1 Peter. It's got a slightly negative feel back then, but you're allowed to take a term of abuse and make it your own, if you wish, that we were Christians. But you do know, I'm sure, I'm sure many of you know, if I ask you, many of you, what is the fundamental way that the Bible describes you and me? It's done over 170-something times, up to about 180. So three times it uses the word Christian, 180, thereabouts, give or take one or two, is the way, the way that God will normally describe you. And it's in the words in verse 3. Don't you know that all of us were baptised into Christ Jesus. The best way to understand the, who you are if you're a Christian or who you are if you're thinking about becoming a Christian is the way that God does. And the phrase he uses repeatedly in the scriptures is you are in Christ. You want to know who you are? That's who you are. You're a woman in Christ or a man in Christ. Much, much, much more important than the fact that you're Australian or the fact of some other thing that is really determinative of much of our life. In terms of your deep, settled, enduring, important identity, you're in Christ. Which kind of speaks of an address. That's where you live. Although it's invisible. But it's eternal. Well, what does it mean by that? That you are in Christ. Before we look at that just briefly... I want to just touch on the significance that it gives here to baptism. Don't you know that of all those who are baptised into Christ Jesus, were baptised into his death, we were therefore buried with him through baptism into death in order that as Christ was raised, we might uh, also live a new life. There are some little parts of the Christian church that will actually say that by baptism you get saved. That Really, that's the thing which is, of course, can't be right, because one of the very few men that we know is in heaven was the man who died next to Jesus on the cross, and Jesus says, you, me, today, heaven. He wasn't baptised. So it cannot be the essential mark at all, and it would make nonsense of the rest of the New Testament to take a verse or two. But what is very clear in the New Testament that when you become a Christian, you get baptised, which is why we use this word christening, for, particularly for little kids. It's the christening it's an infant baptism or sometimes called christening because that's the point, that's, that's the symbolic thing that happens when you become a Christian. So in Acts chapter 8, 
right? the, the Ethiopian eunuch is talking with one of the uh, elders of the church, uh, Philip, and he hears the gospel. And then the, the eunuch says, look, there's water here. What's to stop me getting baptized? So clearly it was clear in the early church's message that when you get saved, you get baptized. And so it's, it's the portrayal of, in the same way as the bread and the wine reminds us what feeds us and keeps us going. It's the broken body of Christ and the poured out blood. So baptism. And it, it does seem that what he's talking about is when you go into the water, you're dying, you're buried, and then when you come out of the water, it's like the resurrection. And it's a picture of what happens in reality when you put your faith into Jesus. You put your trust. And that's, that's the phrase that the Bible most often uses. It's faith and the little preposition that goes after it is into. It moves you away from yourself and into Jesus. Like a person who gets into Noah's ark. They're in the place of safety. So we are moved into Christ. Sorry to labour that point. But this is what it means to be in Christ. And the baptism pictures the essential relationship you're in with Jesus. That as he died and was buried and rose again, that is what has happened to us in reality. So John Calvin and others note that the word baptism could be used of a sailor who drowns. He certainly goes under the water. He's immersed in the water of a ship that sinks. More commonly used, a fabric when it's sort of dunked into, into dye-infested you know, water. So it's got that sense of going under and then coming up in resurrection. And he says, that pictures what, what's happened to you. You're already dead. When did you die? Right. Well, it keeps saying in these verses, doesn't it? You die with Christ. So this is where it gets a little odd. When you enter Jesus, his story becomes your story. It's like if you become an Australian, right? Our history becomes your Australian. You were lucky enough to be born in some other country. You move across and our history becomes your history. The battles that we won become your benefits. The things, bad decisions that we've made over the past become part of the curse that you have to bear. We, we get caught up in it. So when you are in Jesus, everything that has happened to him is yours and has happened to you. So it says here that Christ died to sin and we died to sin with him well what does that mean i take it jesus the death he's talking about here is that when jesus comes down to be one of us he gets immersed in the world of sin and death it doesn't enter his soul he's like a healthy person swimming in a sewer it's not a pleasant place to be but it doesn't necessarily enter into his blood system and so, you know, from the time he was a child, they tried to murder him. Herod has to flee. He gets baptised. Why does he get baptised? The early church, as we've talked about, spent a long time trying to know, why does Jesus get baptised? Who gets baptised? Sinners get baptised. Why does Jesus get baptised? John the Baptist couldn't work that out either. What are you doing here? I should be, you should be baptising me. Jesus just do it. Fulfil all righteousness. Because Jesus is saying, I'm standing with the sinners. That's who I'm identifying with. And he goes through his life as Hebrews. We looked at Hebrews a while back, you know, full of tears and suffering and prayers and difficulty. And finally, he is slaughtered. Right? As sin does its worst to him, and he dies. And as he says, Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. And his relationship in that world engulfed in sin, paying the penalty of sin, the pain of that world, is now behind him. He's died to sin. And we've died with him, as it says. Often you go through this, it'll talk about us being united with Christ, in Christ, with Christ. That's what's happened to him, so that's what's happened to us. So you are in Christ. I remember as a baby Christian, I don't know where I got the book from. It wasn't sort of the recommended reading at the church that I went to. I think it was secondhand. It was a book by a guy called James Stewart. Some of you may remember him, probably, perhaps not. He was a Scottish preacher and he wrote books, which is basically his sermons were put onto paper. And this book was called A Man in Christ. Very helpful book. I read it within my first few months of being a Christian. I had a stellar spiritual experience thanks to it. 
Because for the first time ever, I realised, oh, I'm in Jesus. I'm okay. I'm, I'm as safe with God as Jesus is. Not I'm hoping one day to be okay with God, but he, he was trying to spell this out, this great truth, 180 times in the New Testament. In Christ, in Christ, in Christ. That's where I am. That's who I am. Christian doesn't give you that sort of information. So what happens is whatever's happened to Jesus has happened to you. It's happened to me, if you're in him. The most helpful illustration, I think, is that of an aeroplane. So on September 11th, some years back, if you are in Boston and you got into United Airlines 175, you're in trouble. A whole lot of the other United Airlines you could have got into at Boston Airport, it would have been okay. Or American Airlines Flight 11. These are the planes that, as you know, flew into the um, World Trade Towers. If you're in the plane, your destiny is completely tied up with that plane. If the plane crashes, you're almost certainly dead. If the plane arrives safely, you're okay. We are described as people who are in Jesus. In a sense, you're in this building. If 20 tons of TNT went off in this building, because you are in this building and not in some other building, you're probably going to have a bad day right? because you're in this place. I brought up in my brand new briefcase I got from St. Vincent's to Paul. It's a ripper. Um, I brought up some eggs because I'd promised this person eggs the other day and their husband came round to my place and in the excitement of the conversation I forgot to give her these eggs and the eggs got to church in the briefcase. I'm very forgetful, so early in the morning I put them in the briefcase. If the briefcase gets safely to the church, the eggs get safely to the church, now they've gone out with her to her home and good luck to her. But I'm saying... This is the sense of we are in Jesus. My glasses got into church because they're in my pocket. The chewing gum in my left pocket got into church because it's it. And when I go out, it will go out. And say, that's your relationship with Jesus. Whatever's happened to him has happened to you. So it actually uses the idea of being planted with Jesus. You're like a branch that's plugged into a tree. Now, where does this idea come from? Well, it comes from Jesus. He uses it long before the Apostle Paul uses it. But it's, it's all modelled for us in baptism when we die and rise up with him. Now let me go back to Jesus. So you don't do the silly thing 19th and 20th century people do. Oh, that's just Paul. Where does he get this idea from? Well, John. John's Gospel, chapter 14. Jesus says, because I live, you will also live. On that day you will realise that I am in my Father and you are... In me, and I am in you. I am the vine, and my father is the gardener. Remain in me, and I'll remain in you. Six times he speaks about being in him. The idea of being united with Jesus, completely tied up with him. He's not just a saviour that we trust from a distance, although that's one way we look at it. But when you put your trust in him, God only sees you as in Christ. So from the time you first put your faith in Jesus, God only sees you as in Christ. That's who you are. So when you have a bad day and you're sinful, you're in Christ. When you have a good day and you're spiritual, you're in Christ. When you're asleep, you're in Christ. When you're awake, you're in Christ. That's where you live. Like we live in the planet Earth. We are in Christ. And that's why we're okay with God, isn't it? That's why we're accepted by God, because we are in him. And that's when you died. According to this passage, he died to sin. You died to sin. We've moved. Um, Andrew Vella took us through a few weeks ago that really, from God's perspective, there's only two people, Adam and Christ. You're born in Adam. That's where you live. Everyone lives in Adam, all caught up in what he has done. He's the all-important ancestor who determines and shapes everything. Sin, death. Sorrow, arrogance. When you become a Christian, you put your faith in Christ, you are transferred by God into Christ. That's where you live. So the reason why we confess our sins at the beginning of service is not because, oh, we've sinned, we're in trouble now, we've gone back to Adam. No, 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 no. You're in Christ. You've been an idiot. Better. I've been an idiot. 
but you're always in Christ or in Adam. Your transplant Colossians 1 says you've been transplanted from the kingdom of darkness or the dominion of darkness to the kingdom of his beloved son. That's what happens. Now, when that happened to me when I became a Christian, I was not aware of it. I was not aware of it at all. I didn't think in these categories. But what he'll say in this passage is repeatedly, well, three and a half times, he says, do you not know? Do you not know? Do you not know? He assumes we should know, but we will tend to forget. That's who we are. So we will tend to fall back into old-fashioned ways of thinking, the ways that we were before we met Christ and died. But we're to keep allowing God to reshape our thinking as you'll get to in verse 11 in just a few moments. So it's a whole other way of being and doing things. So at a petty level, those of you who've had the fun and games, and if you've ever, if, if you've ever had the fun of going overseas, that puts us in a tiny, tiny percentage of the world's population uh, when you go to an airport, I remember being in an airport once thinking, man, every man, there's dogs in the airport. Of course they're not. You know? uh, most people never get to try and fly on an aeroplane. But if you do that, I've, I've been to America once. The school I served at sent me across to this school. It was great fun. I, I actually learned some stuff, but it was more fun than anything else. But um, we rented a car, the other Australian. And we had to drive on the wrong side of the road. They're such gits, those people. They drive on the wrong side of the road. So we kept reminding each other, you know. And it was funny. We went okay, except... Uh, one time we were driving and I'd got quite tired and, and we were talking about some interesting stuff. Pulled out of a service station. You need to go to a service station about every five minutes because the car was so big and guzzled the, guzzled the oil, the petrol. We just turned, you know, you turned, and I was chatting away a bit tired, and just turned onto the left-hand side of the road which, of course, put us in line for a head-on collision. I'm surprised there aren't more head-on collisions in Australia because we've got so many people who come from weird countries that drive on the wrong side of the road. It's just a habit. That's how you do it. And when you become a Christian, you've got habits of doing things, thinking, plans, visions, dreams, conversations, the way you respond to, to hostility and stuff like that, all that stuff. Right? No, 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 you've moved to a whole new country out of Adam and sin and death, into Christ. It does lead to a whole new lifestyle, but particularly regarding sin. So you can't say, isn't God gracious? That's all I get. I sort of I get a get out of jail card ticket. Um, no, no, no. We've been moved. We live there. So if you like, you can imagine it. This is how Martin Lloyd-Jones explains it. You can imagine two countries side by side, if you like, like East Germany and West Germany used to be, with a wall and a fence to keep the nasty West Germans from... No, no, to keep the East Germans locked up in that shocking country. What does it say about a country that's got to have a fence and a wall? Think, yeah, that's, that's obviously the sort of government we want. But anyway, you know, if, if you're in this side, on the East German side, uh, it's scary and, and, and there's the Stasi and there's all these sort of things going on. But if you can get away, uh, even if we're not fans of everything about capitalism, a huge explosion of freedom... And possibilities. But imagine, it, you know, if you keep hearing the voices from the other side, you know, it might, it might make you nervous. And you just build a little house somewhere near the fence. And you hear the voice and it's yelling at you to come back and threatening you. You think, no, 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 I don't live there anymore. I, it might take me a long time to get over my fear. But I now live here. I'm in Christ. I'm free, as these verses keep saying. And therefore, of course, we're not going to sin live that hopelessly perverted way of life that's obsessed with me and my, my stuff and, and us and our ways that we've learnt rather than allowing God to guide us in that which is right and good and healthifying. So this is what he's done. We have been transferred. Now, before I just finish up with verse 11, any questions so far? It is a slightly unusual way to think about being in Christ and therefore you're dead to sin but alive to God. Yeah. Don't know. Whether or not that means that they had never actually trusted Christ, they just had some sort of intellectual thing, or whether... Yes, I'm not, I'm not completely sure. Let me think about that. Jesus in John 15, when he talks about it, does speak about remain in my love. So it may be that if, as to use C.S. Lewis's picture, 
God remains a gentleman. That is, if, if you really don't want him, he'll say, okay. But yes, I think the question of what happens to people who were, because in 1 John it speaks about they went out from us, which shows that they were never really of us. Um, so with someone like Judas, was he ever in Christ? Don't know. Yeah. Sorry about that. If I get any more wisdom before I go on holidays, I'll let you know. Yeah. Yes. I imagine it's probably both. I think if I think there are some people that I talk to who their experience of Christ was that they just slowly turned. They they began to learn about Jesus and found him attractive, and maybe just you know were going with their back to Christ and how they turned. I think if you're brought up in a Christian home, which is a um, an amazing blessing. Um, you may have never had a time when you made a decision, but you have basically come to the point of trusting in Christ. But for many people, it is at some stage helpful to say, right, I, I want to I be really clear about this. And so even if you, a person may have turned back to Christ, it's not unhelpful for people sometimes to say, right, I'm just going to pray a prayer telling God I am his and I seek his forgiveness. But, um, yeah, any other questions on that? Right, we'd better move on. Thomas. Mm. Um, well, some of the cutest pictures of me are at my baptism, that's why. Um, <laughs> Because, as I understand it, it works this way, that God is a God who relates to families. Uh, we see that very clearly in the Old Testament. I don't want to run a parallel between so much between circumcision of the boys and that, but there was that pattern. And the Apostle Peter says, uh, this promises to you and to your children. The way I, just in, in brief, I would think is when I have my children and, you know, the parents are Christians, are we going to treat this kid like a little heathen or are we going to let them relate to God as we do? So if you teach your children the Lord's Prayer, that's a prayer for Christians. Right? The Bible never suggests that someone who doesn't put their faith in Jesus yet relate to God as Father because he isn't. Adoption is this great privilege. But if you, I think you treat your children as Christians, therefore they should. it's impossible to be a Christian and not be baptised. It's not impossible, but it's unimaginable for the New Testament. So yes, I think, but Christ, it is a thing which you probably know, in this building, there'd be some people who, who think it's better just to be thankful for your kid and dedicated to God. Uh, others think, no, it's appropriate for baptism. Um, Alice and I aren't having children. If we did, we'd have a, we, would pro, we would go on with our debates about baptism. Um, she's wrong. <laughs> I, think I'm, I think I'm safe. She's not in the building. But, um, okay. Okay. Uh, Let's get to verse 11 and then we better be better finished. Verse 11, it's worth hearing this. I'll leave, listen to a lot of words already. Verse, chapter 6, verse 11, is the first command in the book. It's the first time God tells you to do anything. Because it's very important to say that Christianity is first and foremost about what God does. So where people don't get Christianity. Because I think religion is all about what you do. Chapter 6, verse 11 is the first command. And it's just got to do here with how you think. He's going to give some more instructions at the rest of chapter 6. But even that won't be specifics. You'll get specifics in chapters 12, 13, 14, etc. Some specific calls about how we treat each other. But here's the first time when God actually calls on us to do anything. Listen to what he says. In the, let me read verse 10 as well. The death that Jesus died, he died to sin once for all, but the life he lives, he lives to God. In the same way, that is like Jesus, count yourselves dead to sin, but alive to God in Christ Jesus. Because that's where you live. Right. So the first thing it says is about how you think. Right? The Bible's very concerned about how you think. Because how you think ultimately determines how you live. So what it says is here is we are to consider or count ourselves dead. You are dead. You have already died when Christ died. 
But you're to embrace that reality, to consider yourself dead. Now, that's the word, the word consider or count yourself, is the word that we get our word for logic from. It's a thinking, reasoning, rational thing. It says, right, this is true of me. I have been transplanted. I'm in a new kingdom. I'm in a new planet, the planet of Christ. I am therefore to, to, to consider, to be aware of myself, to reckon myself, to count myself as a dead man, to sin. I'm simply not going to have anything to do with it. It's not my currency. Right? That belongs over there in East Germany. I'm here in West Germany. I don't want to get too caught up in the Germany, sorry. But it just happened, they had a handy wall. See, because what, I think what happens is when, you, when you're young or whatever, when you become a Christian, when you're 90 or whatever, you start off with spiritual dementia. You know, extreme dementia where you, this happens rarely, but it's where people actually lose touch with who they are. They certainly lose touch with who their children are sometimes. I've had this happen to friends of mine where they'd go and see their mum and their mum would not have the faintest clue who they were. They just lost that. But now I think as Christians we start off with almost not the faintest clue who we are. You know, we've prayed a prayer. We've committed ourselves to Jesus. We're calling ourselves Christians. We don't realise we've, we've been placed in Christ. Right? So we start off, as it were, with amnesia. And what the Bible is saying, you need to understand. So there three times it says, don't be ignorant. Know this, know this, know this. Now, think about yourself in the way that you are. You really are in Christ. You really are set free from the power of sin. He's going to talk about the fact that you've still got to make decisions on the basis of it. One of my dearest friends was a heroin addict for many, many, many years. He's not anymore. Uh, he's been clean for decades now. Uh, but there was a time when he was chemically addicted. Right? And there were cells in his brain that had been damaged through misuse, as happens with alcohol, and he had to have it or he got in real physical pain. Alcohol's worse, apparently, if you, if you become an addict to that. It's harder to give up. But it's saying, no, you are not addicted to sin anymore. You've died to it. You still have to make decisions not to use it. We still may, in a sense, be psychologically addicted to sin. But you, you are set free from its power, it says repeatedly in these verses. So we don't need to do it. We need to choose, therefore, not to do it. So when sin yells across from the other kingdom, hey, do this. You know you like it. You can't stop. Waggle that tongue, right? Gossip, lie, backstab, whatever it is you're doing. Or have sex with someone who you're not married to, whatever it is. Um, and, and you think, oh, I can't, I can't help myself. Yes, you can. You can if you're in Christ. You can choose not to obey. Uh, and that's what he's calling us to do here. Let me finish on this. I understand from stuff I've read, it was a bit before my time, that when Abraham Lincoln signed you know, into American law the Proclamation of Emancipation, all the slaves were released. Many of them kind of never adjusted to it. They'd been born slaves. They'd seen the horror of slavery. They were used to obeying. In fact, that was, that was what life was about. And so for many of them, when they were actually released, when they were set free, they still had to remind themselves, I am not a slave. I do not have to obey this white man in the shop. I'm as free as anybody else. So they had been set free. But it took for many of them, and apparently some of them really couldn't do it, they were, they were happier back in the life that they knew. which is a, And what the Bible is saying here is you've been emancipated, not just from the penalty of sin, which you have been, but also from its power, which means that we can now decide, right, I'm going to obey, and with God's strength, I'm going to be who I am. Right? Right, I am a free man, a free woman. Uh, I've died, and I'm starting life again in Christ and for Christ. So... My suggestion is this week, why not think about yourself, pray about yourself, remind yourself. If your faith's in Jesus Christ, you are in Christ. That's who you really are. Everything else is just trivia. Let's pray. Father in heaven, thank you for this weird and wonderful passage that speaks to us so powerfully of the impact that Christ has had on us. Help us, Lord, as your people, to think of ourselves as you speak of us, as men and women who are in Jesus that he is the great determining reality, not just of our relationship with you, our Father, but also with our relationship with selfishness and sin, that you have freed us from its lordship. Help us, Lord, to live as free men and women. In Jesus' name, amen.